in the pantheon of the video games that holds the greatest and most legendary franchises to have ever existed, Resident Evil has remained unmoved for ages. Through ups and downs, this is a series that has reinvented itself time and time again, and has provided numerous experiences that rank among not only the greatest of its genre, but of the entire industry as a whole. And while things such as level design, atmosphere, and its knack for producing primal scares in players have always been hallmarks of the franchise, the narrative it has woven over the course of dozens of games is also something that has endeared itself to millions of people. No, it's not the perfect story and has been prone to flights of extremely corny fantasy a few too many times. But in the grand scheme of things, over the years, Resident Evil managed to craft a winding and engrossing story. In this multi-part feature, we'll be taking a long and detailed look at the story of Resident Evil. Without further ado then, let's get started. Before we get started and jump into the events of Resident Evil Zero, the first canonical game in the series, let's take a few moments to, as always, set up some of the events in the history of the series' timeline that will go on to define much of what happens. There's going to be plenty to talk about before we even get to the events portrayed in the very first chronological game itself, so buckle in. The one name you'll see coming up in Resident Evil more than any other is Umbrella. It all begins with Umbrella. So what exactly is Umbrella? Well, to answer that question, we first need to jump back a few years, all the way back to 1962, where we look at three integral characters who will, in more ways than one, go on to shape the vast majority of the events that transpire in many Resident Evil games through their actions. Dr. Oswell E. Spencer, Dr. Edward Ashford, and Dr. James Marcus. It begins when the three young scientists gain information on a wildflower called Stairway of the Sun that grows in a very specific area of West Africa. The flower, it is said, bestows powers and superhuman capabilities to all those who consume it. After the three scientists do some digging around, they draw from this myth a scientific hypothesis, that the flower is the cause of a mutagenic viral infection, caused by a virus inside of it, which they go on to dub the progenitor virus, which in turn leads to what, according to the local folklore, are powers. The three of them believe that the flower can be used to create an improved and superior form of humans. When they attempt to cultivate the flower back in the United States, though, they find that their attempts are resulting in constant failure. The flower, it seems, needs very specific conditions to be able to grow properly. Spencer, Ashford, and Marcus realize that they're going to need a lot of funding if they want to continue their research. And the solution to their dilemma turns out to be Umbrella. Spencer, with his two partners, decides to set up a pharmaceutical company, Umbrella Corporation, so that they can use the money that they make from that to keep funding their research. They have a few other irons in the fire as well, however. Spencer, Ashford, and Marcus decide to also keep selling their products of their research, those being bioorganic weapons, or BOWs, to the United States military. Weaponizing a virus sounds like a terrible idea, no matter how you frame it, but clearly the trio does not care. They make a lot of money from selling their progenitor virus to the military, money which they can use to keep their research going. Spencer takes that money and makes heavy investments with it. He builds an entire lab for himself in the Arklay Mountains, just outside of the Midwestern Raccoon City. On top of his lab, he issues the construction of an elaborate mansion, one full of traps and a labyrinthian design, all of which existed for the purposes of keeping his lab, and as such, his work, safe and hidden. Later on, he would invite George Trevor, the architect of the mansion, and his family, his wife Jessica and their daughter Lisa, to the mansion under the pretext of celebrating the construction of the mansion. As the word pretext may have probably given it away, Spencer would go on to kill both George and Jessica, wanting to make sure that no one other than him can know the complete ins and outs of the mansion. And Lisa? Well, we'll get to her later. Spencer's devilish machinations, as this incident demonstrated, begin to take ugly shapes. By now, Spencer, Ashford, and Marcus, in spite of having been once partners, have essentially become fierce competitors of each other. They've all been conducting independent research on the progenitor virus, and have been involved in what is essentially an arms race against one another. In 1968, under mysterious circumstances, an accident orchestrated by Spencer, Ashford is exposed to the progenitor virus and dies and is survived by his son, who is a geneticist, Alexander Ashford. There's a bucket load of stuff that goes on with Alexander and the Ashford family, but we'll be talking about that in great detail later, so keep this tucked away in the back of your mind for now. 
For now, let's jump forward all the way to 1978, a year which is quite significant in the history of Resident Evil. Why? Well, by this time, Dr. Marcus has spent roughly a decade doing research on the virus, and has now finally managed to make a breakthrough. Combining the virus with leech DNA, Marcus creates a new mutation of it, the T-Virus, a much deadlier bioweapon. While the progenitor virus was one that would kill those who got infected by it, the T-Virus functions in a different way thanks to its mutations. It keeps those infected alive in a mentally damaged state and turns them into violent and cannibalistic animals who function at those capacities and those capacities only after the virus causes a cardiac arrest. Translation, it turns them into zombies. Marcus didn't do this alone, however. He accomplished this task with the help of two young researchers he had recently taken under his wing, a brilliant young scientist named Dr. William Birkin and a promising researcher named Albert Wesker. As Spencer takes note of Marcus's accomplishments, he grows wary. The fierce competition between the two has persisted even now in spite of the fact that both of them remain in high leadership positions at Umbrella, and he begins to take steps to make sure that Marcus isn't able to overthrow or outpace him. Let's pause here and spend just a little bit of time talking about Albert Wesker and his past, because he's a character who's going to be extremely important for a large chunk of this series. When he was a child, he, among many others, was collected by Umbrella on account of having superior and more intelligent genes. For what purpose was Umbrella doing this, though? Well, as you might remember, the reason Spencer even began his research into the virus all of those years ago was so that he could use its effects to create a superior species of humans. These children were to be Spencer's test subjects. The head of this program, called Project W, was one Dr. Wesker, after whom Spencer not only named the program, but even all of the children who were a part of it. All these children, after their abductions, were kept in controlled environments by Spencer, who ensured that they received the best education and qualifications, but also ensured that they were constantly brainwashed and indoctrinated with his own philosophies. All the Wesker children would be injected with a prototype virus, but only very few of them would ever survive. 93% of them would succumb to the virus. Among these children, Spencer found that the most promising was Albert Wesker. It was then no surprise, when he turned 17 in 1977, he joined up with Umbrella as one of its prodigious researchers. Now, back to the story at hand. Following the advancements that Marcus has made, Spencer has been taking steps to ensure that he doesn't get left behind in his former partner's wake. By 1988, those steps have come to fruition for Spencer, and he has managed to take two of Marcus's most trusted confidants, the aforementioned William Birkin and, of course, Albert Wesker, and has brought them into his own fold. Now working for Spencer instead of the oblivious Marcus, Birkin and Wesker, on the orders of their new boss, execute an attack on Marcus. While he's working on a queen leech that he's injected with the T-virus as part of his experiments, Marcus is attacked and assassinated by Wesker and Birkin. With the help of Spencer, Birkin not only takes credit for the work done by Dr. Marcus, but also gains access to all of his research, which empowers him to take that research even further. This is where Lisa Trevor comes into play. Remember her? The daughter of the architect of the Spencer mansion? Well, yes, the very same. It's been years since she was abducted by Spencer, so what's been going on with her? Well, this entire time, she's basically been a test subject for Spencer and his scientists in the lab under the mansion. And somehow, after all of these years of being a lab rat, she's managed to cling on to life. Thanks to a convoluted series of events, Birkin ends up using her as a last viable subject in one of his experiments, which involves a deadly parasite that reacts with an isolated and mutated progenitor strand within her, creating something entirely new altogether. She grows hideous tentacles and begins to show signs of regenerative capabilities. As time goes on over the next few years, Lisa begins recovering some amounts of intelligence, which had been lost due to her result of having been infected to the T-virus. As a result, she begins attacking researchers in the lab under the mansion. By the time she has killed her third researcher, Umbrella decides that she's too dangerous and executes her. But don't worry, she'll be back. Just not right now. Going back to the moment that she is experimented on by Birkin, though, the mutated strain of the progenitor virus within her is quickly identified as the cause. The virus, unlike the T-virus, bestows regenerative capabilities to those who are infected with it and can essentially make them biologically immortal. 
Birkin gives it the name G-Virus, and when Spencer catches wind of his accomplishments and what the virus is capable of, he decides to invest heavily in Birkin to allow him to keep his research going. For this purpose, Umbrella builds Nest, a huge underground laboratory not far from the mansion itself placed right underneath Raccoon City. At Nest, Birkin and his wife Annette are in charge. This will be important later on, so do not forget about this. We're almost at Resident Evil Zero by now. Just a little more backstory for one more character. Let's go back to Wesker for a bit, shall we? In 1996, a few years after construction on Nest is completed, Wesker joins up with a special division in the Raccoon City Police Department known as the Special Tactics and Rescue Service, or STARS, an elite force within the RPD. Here, Wesker functions as an undercover agent for Umbrella Corporation, to whom he is constantly giving information on investigations conducted by the RPD in order to make sure that they don't catch wind of what's going on at Umbrella. But of course, Wesker also has selfish motivations for basically everything he does, which we'll get into that later on. By 1998, Wesker has become the captain of STARS, as well as a leader of the division's alpha team. And 1998 is where we finally move into the events of Resident Evil proper. It starts off when the Ecliptic Express, a train owned by the Umbrella Corporation, mysteriously comes under attack by a swarm of leeches, with the entire crew and all of the passengers aboard presumably being killed. Very shortly, just a few hours later in fact, reports begin emerging of cannibalistic attacks taking place in the Arclay Mountains, just outside of Raccoon City. To investigate these attacks, the RPD dispatches a star squad to the mountains, and that, finally, is where Resident Evil Zero picks up. And that's it for part one. In part two, we'll be covering the events of Resident Evil Zero as well as Resident Evil 1. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.